Hi, everybody. This is lecture four in our series of lectures on the trivium, that is, the first three of the classical liberal arts, grammar, rhetoric, and logic. Uh, so far, we've discussed the liberal arts and grammar, and last time we introduced rhetoric. This time, we continue with our discussion of rhetoric, looking specifically at the three rhetorical appeals, uh, logos, pathos, ethos. So let's uh, get started. These three appeals, like the kinds of discourse that we looked at before, um, any text can have all three of these appeals, or one of these appeals, or two of these appeals. They overlap with each other. So these are kind of ideal types, right? It's not saying that any text will have exclusively any one of these three. But knowing this distinction can be helpful as you analyze any text to try to determine what the speaker is doing in that moment and to determine then how you will respond to it. Uh, thanks for the creator of this image. Thanks to the creator of this image from Google Images um, on ethos, pathos, and logos, the three rhetorical appeals. Ethos pertains to the speaker in a way that we will discuss. Uh, pathos pertains to the audience trying to dry, draw out a certain emotional response. Uh, and logos pertains to the message itself, what argument is being made. Let's take a look at all three of these uh, kinds of appeal. Ethos um, does not pertain to ethics exactly. It is the Greek is related to the Greek term for ethics, um, but as we have here on the slide, it has been made to represent the credibility of the person making a communication, in this case the speaker. Ethos is established through a variety of factors including status, awareness, professionalism, celebrity endorsement, research, and so forth. Build ethos to make your audience trust what you're saying, right? Well, that's what ethos does. Um, if you have a, a good ethos as, as a speaker, you know, this could be established just by like degrees that you hold, um, but more um, commonly will be established just by how you speak, right? Are you are you making eye contact with the speak, uh, with your listener? Are, are you uh, creating an atmosphere of trust? Are you giving them reasons to trust you, right? Continuing with this, ethos refers to what we're calling ethical appeal, uh, and that means credibility in this context. It's not about right and wrong. Um, it is about right and wrong, I guess, in the sense that you as a speaker are convincing the audience that you are an ethical person in the sense of being trustworthy, uh, right? But it more has to do with the ability, the skill, and the character and knowledge of the speaker. You want the audience to be willing to listen to you personally, and there are lots of ways to establish that. This appeal, of course, as we have on the slide here, can be misused if a person appeals to achievements in one field, maybe in order to claim competence in another. So just because I'm good in one field doesn't mean that I have the credibility or the authority to speak in another field. Um, also, this can be used uh, in ways uh, to sway an audience, as all of these appeals can be, uh, to sway an audience kind of irrationally to your side, of uh, to your view. Right? So we need to take care in any time we're talking about rhetoric that the uh, rhetoric that we're using uh, conforms to the truth of the matter and is not being used to mislead, although it often is. Our second rhetorical appeal <clears throat> is pathos. This refers to emotion. Um, have on the t slide here, pathos is the Greek term for emotion, uh, but has been made to represent how an audience feels or experiences a message. The appeal of pathos makes a person feel excited, sad, angry, motivated, jealous, or any other number of emotions. They may persuade them to act based on what you say. This is maybe the most, uh, so to speak, irrational of the three appeals, but potentially so. Uh, emotion, emotional responses can be, uh, in their own way, reasoned or, or, or rational. Um, but here, you're, you're not appealing to the, to the intellect of the hearer. You're not, not appealing to them assessing your credibility. You're trying to draw out a certain emotional response. Um, Hauser uh, refers to this as following. Uh, the speaker attempts to say things in a way that will unleash in the hearts of the audience the quote-unquote right emotions. That is, the emotions that go hand in hand with the conclusions the speaker is attempting to have them draw. In Hauser's book, he discusses two examples of this, um, Winston Churchill and Adolf Hitler uh, being quite differently 
oriented in terms of their aims, but both of them were able to draw out this kind of emotional response from the audience. Uh, this is certainly a form of rhetorical appeal, uh, again, about which one really needs to be careful, both in uh, hearing uh, rhetoric and also in using it. And our final kind of uh, rhetorical appeal is logos, and this refers to logic, which is going to be the subject of the rest of our lectures in this course. Logos is the Greek term for logic, but has been made to represent the facts, research, and other message elements that provide proof or evidence to a claim. Use logos to convince your audience that what they are hearing or seeing is well-researched, well-built, or otherwise worth their time. So I could be a credible person. I could seem really credible, but maybe I don't give good evidence or I don't uh, succeed in convincing my audience. Um, also, maybe I have a great argument. I've got all kinds of evidence. It's very well-researched, well-documented claim, but the audience doesn't trust me, right? Or I fail to kind of motivate them emotionally to care about what I'm saying. So this is a reminder that all three of these appeals really need to go together. They interweave with each other. In the case of rational appeal, we read from Hauser, um, the speaker concentrates on the message about the topic at hand that they are trying to deliver. Uh, this appeals to the mind of the audience with facts and arguments. Um, as I just uh, noted as well, though, uh, logic alone is rarely enough to convince an audience. You really need to consider all three of these appeals together in order to have the desired effect. Uh, and that is why they are presented as being in a kind of triangle. I wouldn't say that ethos is necessarily the cap of this triangle. Um, I guess it could be. Logos is the kind of base. Uh, so you have to have a foundation in logic. Um, I invite you to your own reflection on this. But those are the three. Ethos, pathos, and logos. Now, <clears throat> when you encounter any kind of text, from a TikTok to a blog post to a news article or a scholarly paper, um, you need to be able to distinguish the different kinds of appeals being made by that author. Um, an ethical appeal usually appears at the beginning of a speech, and as we've said, that can take any variety of forms. You want to, I guess a term could be to ingratiate yourself, right? You, you want the audience to feel willing to accept your message. Um, a good speech uh, usually ends with an emotional appeal. So the emotional appeal might be at the end, right? You might This might be ringing in your ears as the audience departs the speech or puts down the pamphlet or, or newspaper or closes the app or, or whatever the case may be. Um, th this is uh, reminding us of the difficult task of concluding an essay, for example, right? You get to the end of the essay. Okay, maybe it's you don't want to make a straightforwardly emotional appeal, but you want somehow to say something that wraps up everything you've been saying, that somehow integrates it, right? That, that gives the reader a sense of finality. You don't just stop talking, right? You want, you want to kind of crescendo at, at the end. And rational appeal makes up most of the, the content and the middle part of good persuasive discourse. So, you know, they trust you. They know who you are. Uh, maybe you're interspersing some kind of emotional appeal in various places. Maybe you're concluding with a kind of rhetorical flourish, we would say, that, that, that it has a, a certain emotional appeal. But the body is really focused on laying out the reasons for what you are saying. Um, there are some relevant factors here identified by Hauser, and I, I think it's useful to keep these things in mind. So the three factors in the orator's character relevant to ethical appeal, their good sense, their good moral character, and their goodwill. If you think a person is a little nuts, right? You're not going to listen to them. If you think they've done things that are immoral, that will also affect your hearing of their words. And goodwill is maybe the big one here, right? If you don't trust that the speaker has your best intentions in mind, you're not going to be willing to hear what, what she has to say. Factors about the human condition that apply to the speaker relevant to ethical appeal or to the audience relative to emotional appeal. Their age, right? What stage of life are they in? Or their status? Uh, the, uh, where were they born? <laughs> are they wealthy or not? What kind of uh, power do they have in the society? These are things that you need to consider anytime you're reading anything, right? Because this helps you to assess who the speaker is speaking to and who is the person who is speaking. Where, where do they kind of stand 
socially. And finally, Aristotle's list of human emotions that the good speaker must understand and can use. And this is kind of an exciting list because if you're a speaker, you want to keep in mind all of these emotions. This is your toolbox. These are the, these are the things that you can work with when you're speaking with an audience to achieve the desired effect. Anger and calmness, friendship and hatred, fear and confidence, shame and shamelessness, kindness and unkindness, pity, indignation, envy, emulation. So take a look at that list. Um, keep those in mind when you're speaking with anybody and be aware of what you, you know, what buttons are you pushing in the audience, right? Is it is it right to push that button? Is, is it moral to push that button? This is maybe a further question we can ask, again, anytime we're talking about rhetoric. I want to conclude this, this will be a briefer lecture, with some discussion of this text by uh, one of the sophists. We met the sophists last time when we talked about the kind of invention or, or birth of rhetoric. Um, these were people who were paid to educate especially young men in the context of ancient Athens in the skills of rhetoric. Why? Not just because it was nice to do, but because power in that society as a democracy depended on the ability to stand up and make a compelling case in public before an audience. Right? So this uh, person, Gorgias, I'll put up some information about his text here, uh, was one of these so-called sophists. He was a person who went from place to place and convinced uh, parents, basically, that they should entrust to him the teaching of their sons, right? That, that he could teach them to be effective speakers. Um, he composed this text, the Encomium of Helen, as a kind of advertisement of his skill we have on the slide here. If he could persuade the Greeks to forgive Helen of Troy, he could persuade anyone of anything. Now, just to refresh some of the um, relevant uh, backstory here, right? uh, Gorgias uh, is talking about Helen of Troy, and Helen of Troy was hated by people in Greece. Why? Because she was understood to have been the cause of the Trojan War. So her husband, Agamemnon, uh, in Greece uh, uh, was out of town. I will, I will butcher the story from this point, but I'll try to get out the key elements. Um, and uh, Paris uh, from Troy uh, came and convinced Helen or took Helen or somehow got Helen to come with him back to Troy. Um, in his rage, Agamemnon launched the Trojan War, uh, and it was not a very good affair for anybody. And Helen of Troy was widely blamed for having caused it, right? If she had not gone with Paris, then she would, um, then the war would not have started in the first place. So by choosing to talk about Helen of Troy, what Gorgias is doing is, it's almost like uh, I'm going to give a speech um, uh, convincing um, members of the U.S. Defense Department of Defense that Osama bin Laden is a good guy, right? It's like taking the, the, the most extreme example of something that a certain audience is not disposed to accept and proving um, to that audience that they should accept that conclusion, right? So for Greeks, at the time when Gorgias lived, uh, Helen of Troy was kind of in the position in our little illustration there of Osama bin Laden, a, a figure who for many, especially in the defense establishment in the West, is, is regarded as as uh, indefensible character. Right? Um, in his text, The Encomium of Helen, Gorgias um, shows all three modes of rhetorical appeal, ethos, pathos, and logos. Um, and it also gives us especially a good example of the argument, of the use of argument in the context of a speech. Now, what we're going to do here in this lecture is just look at a few little passages from this to kind of introduce the text. Uh, and then if we are working together, we will talk about this in class. And if not, uh, I will link uh, to the text in the description. Yes, that's, that is what I will do. So <clears throat> he starts out here, Gorgias, at the very beginning of the speech. This is the beginning, the very opening lines. Uh, it's only about a page and a half. It's not, not a long text. Um, by making three statements that I will propose to you, establish his ethos as a speaker. And we'll talk about how they do so. Statement one, first sentence of the speech. What is becoming to a city is manpower, to a body, beauty, to a soul, wisdom, to an action, virtue, to a speech, truth, and the opposites of these are unbecoming. So 
Becoming here means kind of suited to or appropriate for, right? So in order for, uh, you know, what is best for a body is that it should be beautiful. What is best for a soul is that it should exhibit wisdom and so forth. Um, this is a statement, you know, I mean, once you understand what it's saying, it's the kind of thing that people would say, well, yes, I agree with that statement, right? You, the speaker, have just said something that I agree with. That makes sense to me. The second sentence, man and woman and speech and deed and city and object should be honored with praise, if praiseworthy, and be blamed if blameworthy. For it is an equal error to mistake, uh, an equal error and mistake to blame what should be praised and to praise what should be blamed. Right? Okay, lots of words, but a pretty straightforward claim. If it's praiseworthy, praise it. If it's blameworthy, blame it. Right? So again, a hearer would say, okay, yeah, I'm with you, right? I agree. That makes sense to me. Third sentence. It is the duty of one and the same man both to speak rightly about what is needed and to refute what is not spoken rightly. Okay. Everyone's again nodding their heads. Three sentences. Everyone agrees, right? So this speaker has just said three things that the audience will agree with and that make him seem like a reasonable person. It's like, yes, praise what is praiseworthy, blame what is blameworthy. Yes, there are certain things that are appropriate for a city and certain things that are not, okay? So in this way, he's establishing his credibility, and I propose to you that this is establishing his ethos, right? He's laying a foundation of agreement with an intention now to introduce massive disagreement. Thus it is right. Now here he's laying down his gauntlet. Thus it is right to refuse those who rebuke, uh, to refute those who rebuke Helen of Troy, a woman about whom the testimony of inspired poets has become as unanimous as the bad omen of her name, which has come to remind us of misfortunes. Right? So he's acknowledging here that the poets, her reputation, everybody is against Helen. Right? But he's saying it is right to refute those who rebuke her, that is, to prove wrong those who criticize her. Right? He is going to defend her, and he states his thesis here. For myself, by introducing some reasoning into my speech, I wish to free the accused of blame, and having reproved her detractors as liars and proved the truth, to free her from their ignorance. Right? So there's also contained here an element of what we can call imminent critique. Right? Because in the first uh, part of the speech, the three statements that we opened with, um, he is getting people to agree that, yes, if someone is praiseworthy, they should be praised. And if they are blameworthy, they should be blamed. Right? They agree with that. So now he says he is going to prove that Helen, the person that everyone blames most of all in Greece at that time, is actually not blameworthy right? and therefore should not be blamed. So he's actually appealing in substance to what he said earlier to convince them that they should change their deeply held belief on this point. And this is the, the last slide that we'll have here. We're not going to look at the speech in, in great detail. I won't belabor that in the context of this lecture. But let's look at just the arguments he makes, because he makes four in particular, and he moves through them very systematically. I shall set forth, he writes, the causes through which it was likely that Helen's voyage to Troy should take place. Why did she leave Troy with Paris? Why did she end up there and thus uh, incur the wrath of Agamemnon and launch, you know, a thousand ships, as we say, begin the Trojan War? Well, it was likely, and he introduces that, so he's not saying it was definitely. He can't do that, right, because he doesn't have that information. But looking at it, he says, it's likely one of the following four. One, will of fate and decision of the gods and vote of necessity, two, that she was taken by force, three, that she was seduced by words, or four, that she was captured by love. Right? Just briefly commenting on those. Uh, will of fate and decision of the gods and vote of necessity. Um, it was her destiny to do this. The Zeus said so. The gods determined that this should be the case. In that case, you can't blame Helen. I mean, we have, um, in this view, a certain fate or a certain destiny. We're just playing out the narrative, right? So if you accept that, then Helen is not blameworthy for this action. Two, she was taken by force. Okay, what if Paris, like, just 
took her, took her away, right? Um, and she was went kicking and screaming. In that case, you can't blame her because she was not acting according to her own will. She was acting against her will or actually being acted upon. And in that case, you cannot blame her. The third, she was seduced by words. Okay, so what if her ethical agency, so to speak, was compromised? She, she you know, she she was uh, sold a sold a line. She was uh, Paris used beautiful words, rhetoric, to to fool her, right, to delude her into thinking that she should leave. In that case, at the very least, her responsibility for her actions and what happened subsequently is. Um, is diminished or vitiated, right? I mean, it's it's not that she consciously, full of, full awareness, made this decision, um, but that would mean that she's not to blame, at least fully, for her actions. And the final, most interesting one, maybe, is that she was captured by love, uh, and in a way, um, he uh, Gorgias uh, treats love here as a kind of drug. Right? or something, again, that kind of compromises your ability to make moral choices. That if she was really in love with Paris, then yeah, sure, she might have known rationally what she should do, uh, but she was, she was similarly seduced, right? She was acting not entirely with, a, with a, an undivided will. Um, so in all of these cases, whether it's fate, or she was coerced, or she was seduced by words, or she was captured by love, Helen is not to blame. And he concludes the speech thus, how then can you think blaming Helen is just? Since she did what she did from love, or was persuaded by speech, or abducted by force, or because of fate. Whatever way, she is completely acquitted. Right? And notice Gorgias fought, lists all four of the reasons that he gives in reverse order at the end of the speech and kind of walking the reader back through what he discussed. Very short speech, um, but it was kind of a calling card, right? I mean, he's basically saying, hey, if I can convince you of this, I can teach your son to convince anybody of anything at all, right? This is the use of rhetoric. This is also one of the reasons why logic um, as d developed by Aristotle and suggested already by, by Plato and Socrates, would come to be seen as so important. Because if I can use the tools of rhetoric to achieve anything, convince anybody of anything, then how can we even know what is true? How can you trust a speaker if they might be manipulating you through a kind of propaganda? Right? Logic thus becomes very important. Friends, that concludes our discussion of rhetoric. We've thus treated the first two of the seven liberal arts, grammar and rhetoric, and we will begin the third and final one uh, in the remainder of these lectures, starting next time by looking at Aristotle and the invention of logic.